In my study of the great American legal thinkers, I've been struck by the importance of the mentor-protege relationship. These were figures who achieved little in isolation. They cultivated relationships to fulfill needs both intellectual and emotional. Today, I want to talk about three such legal leaders. Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., the celebrated Supreme Court Justice, John Henry Wigmore, the Dean of Northwestern Law, and Roscoe Pound, the Dean of Harvard Law. Holmes's impact on Wigmore took place in the context of a close personal relationship that spanned 50 years, five zero years. They began exchanging letters in 1887, when Holmes was a little known state judge, and Wigmore, only a 24-year-old law student. Wigmore had just published his first academic articles, which elicited this response from Holmes. I have read your articles on boycotting and interference with social relations with much interest and hope that as soon as I get through sitting with the full court, you will give me an opportunity to talk with you about them. No doubt such a compliment from a justice on the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court was a source of great encouragement and pride for the young Wigmore. Holmes continued to read Wigmore's academic work and encouraged the aspiring scholar throughout the latter's earliest years in academia. Wigmore, in turn, thrived on Holmes's support. In 1893, Holmes caught Wigmore outside of Young's Hotel in Boston and asked the budding academic to join him at his window table at the restaurant in the hotel. Wigmore was distressed over his career, but Holmes's reassurance fortified Wigmore's faith in himself. Four decades later, Wigmore recalled the meal in a birthday letter to Holmes. He wrote, other utterances of yours have had national significance, but your words on that day have been like apples of silver to me. And on this, your anniversary, I'd like to repeat to you this acknowledgement of your influence upon your admiring disciple. Holmes's visit to Northwestern Law in 1902 is the most illustrative example of Holmes's deep investment in Wigmore and Wigmore's acute veneration of Holmes. Northwestern Law was set to move into a historic building where, Steve, where Abraham Lincoln had challenged Stephen Douglas to their famous debates. Holmes acceded to Wigmore's request to serve as the guest of honor. This would be the first and only time in Holmes's long life that he ever traveled west of the Allegheny Mountains. Eager to impress the Supreme Court's latest nominee, Wigmore had hung up a portrait of Holmes in the law school. Wigmore relayed to Holmes, it will be an inspiration to our young men as they look up from the perusal of good Massachusetts opinions. Wigmore prepared an elaborate ceremony to honor Holmes's appearance at the dedication of the law building. Colonel Franco Loudon, president of the alumni, asked that Holmes sign and date a panel with a diamond pencil to commemorate the visit. Loudon presented Holmes uh, with the pencil as a gift. Uh, but Wigmore was eager to keep the memento, and after Holmes had returned to Washington, he even asked Holmes to return it to him. He wrote, possessing as yet but few traditions, yet keenly appreciating their helpfulness, we were determined to preserve all that pertains to the Holmes tradition. For his part, Holmes was happy to indulge his fervent admirer, responding, I am glad that you sent for it, as I would much rather the college should have it than I. It is little surprise that Wigmore would take such pains to secure a seemingly trivial keepsake. Holmes had effusively praised Wigmore in his keynote address at the ceremony. Holmes announced to the gathering, I never have had an opportunity to give public expression to my sense of the value of the work of your accomplished dean. I wish now to express my respect for his great learning and originality and for the volume and delicacy of his production. In a letter to the wife of English jurisprudent Frederick Pollock, Holmes revealed that his generous comments about Wigmore were more than just polite. He wrote, as I soaped the dean, I was sure of having one nearer in my favor, but I said no more than I meant. The next pleasantest thing to be intelligently cracked up oneself is to give a boost to a younger man who seems to deserve it and who has not yet had much public recognition. 
If Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. was the high priest of modern legal thought on the bench, Roscoe Pound was his counterpart in academia, and Wigmore was the link that connected them. In a career that lifted Pound from an adjunct position at the University of Nebraska to the deanship of Harvard Law School, he produced books and articles that proved tremendously influential in shaping the tenor of American legal theory. Pound was renowned for sociological jurisprudence, that is, the use of social scientific research to guide the law. Pound first caught Wigmore's attention in 1905, when Pound was an unknown legal scholar in Nebraska. Pound had just published an article in the Columbia Law Review that had a central message um, that, had, that shared much in common with Wigmore's own hugely influential treatise on evidence. Lockstep with Wigmore, Pound argued that the common law was too individualistic and should treat individual cases in the context of their broader social import. Wigmore wrote Pound to express his approval of the article, and the young Nebraskan was grateful for the kind word. Decades later, after Wigmore's death, Pound recalled that, quote, many a young man who had diffidently published his first paper in a law review was encouraged to enter a fruitful career of law writing by an appreciative letter from the author of the treatise on evidence. I well remember how when I published my first paper in an important law review, it brought me at once a letter from Dean Wigmore, who I had never met. If Pound's article implicitly shared much in common with Wigmore's treatise, then Pound's incendiary address the following year at the American Bar Association drew explicitly from Wigmore's work. On August 29th, 1906, the leaders of the profession gathered in the Capitol building for the annual meeting of the ABA. Instead of offering the traditionally uncontroversial declamation, Pound issued a strident indictment of the law entitled, Causes for Popular Dissatisfaction with the Administration of Justice. He characterized the American legal system as inefficient, defective, antiquated, obsolete, and archaic. Pound later acknowledged in a letter to Wigmore that, quote, a great deal of the actual material of the paper was derived from a somewhat careful reading of your work on evidence. Our judges ought to be made in some way to read the critical portions of that book. Immediately following Pound's speech, the reform-minded Everett P. Wheeler suggested that the association send copies of the address to the Judiciary Committees in the House and Senate in Congress. The conservative leaders of the bar were outraged at the prospect of the association's willful dissemination of such heresies. While Wheeler's motion was tabled, a temporary victory for the bar's reactionaries, Wigmore was moved by Pound's words. He listened with a thrill to the speech and joined like-minded jurists on the steps of the Capitol building in Minnesota to discuss how they could bring Pound's ideas to bear on legal practice. Soon after, Wigmore remarked to Holmes, who is now on the Supreme Court, if you haven't read Causes for Popular Dissatisfaction with the Administration of Justice, pray do so. Under a modest guise, he conceals the most erudite and clear-seeing mind aged 37, now in this country. Three decades later, Wigmore recalled that, quote, for many ensuing years, the St. Paul speech was the catechism for all progressive-minded lawyers and judges. That speech made history, end quote. After the ABA meeting, Wigmore cultivated his budding relationship with Pound. In 1907, Wigmore invited Pound to join him uh, to have dinner with Holmes in Washington and in so doing, united two people who would ultimately be identified as the giants of modern legal thought. Charmed to have met the Supreme Court Justice, Pound wrote to Wigmore, it would not be possible for me to express my indebtedness to you for the opportunity of meeting him, which you gave me. Holmes, for his part, responded after the meal, I wish I could have seen more of you and your pal. The Justice later commented to Frederick Pollock, the two best men that I know of, of the generation or half generation after us in this country are Wigmore and Roscoe Pound. A few weeks after the dinner in Washington, Wigmore began an aggressive campaign to bring Pound to Northwestern law. In a letter soliciting the support of Northwestern University President A.W. Harris, 
Wigmore gushed effusively over Pound. According to Wigmore, Pound, quote, has not only read every book I have read, but almost every book I have known of. As I look over the field at this crucial moment, there is no one known to me who could for a moment be compared to him. I would regard it as an extraordinary find if we could attach him to our school. Harris acquiesced, and Pound seized the opportunity to join a law faculty of national stature. Known for writing funny legal verses, Wigmore penned a poem for Pound that aptly illustrates Wigmore's enthusiasm for this recent addition to his law school. All hail the newest star, now fixed amidst our constellation. A brilliant varied spectrum marks your lofty stellar station. As a sociologic jurist, may the message of your pen widely spread a mighty influence through your editorial den. When Pharaoh set the Israelites to make bricks without straw, he didn't know how harder it would be to reform the law. But Pharaoh had his Moses, you're the Moses by whose hand. Our common law will pass from bondage to the promised land. 30 years later, Wigmore boasted, I was the far-seeing jurist who discovered Roscoe. In Wigmore's rendition, Pound, quote, was scintillating in the then faraway Nebraska Plains. I detected his talent, kidnapped him to Chicago, and there set him upon an eminence. Within a few years, uh, Pound would move on to Harvard Law and eventually become the dean there. For all that Wigmore had learned from Holmes about the law, this was the most important lesson, the value of cultivating the next generation. Thank you. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu. Thank you.